Hi everybody, Tug here, and today we're going to get back into our quick campaign setting for D&D. &D. If you missed the first installment of this series, you can catch one of the links up here that I'll, I'll put somewhere. Uh, and we're going to pick up where we left off. So we've done a little bit of building for a very quick and dirty campaign setting. This is kind of the bare minimum that you should be doing if you're thinking about starting a homebrew world. But oftentimes people do too much. They flesh out too much. They overwhelm themselves with all the different things that comes to making an entire world when really you need to narrow your scope and your focus. So that's what this video series is trying to teach you. So let's pick up where we left off and get building some worlds. All right, so let's dive back in. Time for a quick recap of what we went over last time. We've got our starting village. We established our starting village and we laid out a little bit of the groundwork of where the campaign is going to start. This is where we're going to do the most work is in this starting area and the areas around it. And then as we get out into the tangential areas, we're going to get less and less specific about stuff. So we laid out our starting village, which I now realize we never named. So we'll have to do that. <laughs> That's kind of an important thing. Uh, so we'll name our starting village. We know that the village is going to be steeped in a little bit of intrigue that there's a precursor civilization that was there where uh, one of the main antagonists who could also end up being an ally if the players go that route um, discovered old ruins from the precursor civilization and has been selling artifacts on the sly because it's a very controlled market for that kind of thing and she doesn't want anybody else coming in and stealing her profits so She's looking to keep it secret from the outsiders, so she's looking to hire some people for tangential things associated with uh, that business. There are two inns in this small village. Uh, that's a two-inn town, so we have a high-end uh, inn and we have a low-rent one. The low-rent one is the Frenzied Badger. The high-rent one is the Crimson Pegasus run by our antagonist, Annabelle Rose, uh, who is an heiress left by her father. All the different pieces of the business were left to her by her father, but she's actually super ruthless and uh, should be good. We'll, we'll come back and craft a little bit more of her and, and some of the starting perspective stuff eventually. But right now for this episode, we're going to keep expanding outwards and see where we can get to and how much further we need to build out. Um, <clears throat> so this is going to be a points of light setting. If you're not familiar with that, I made a note of it because it's a very important thing to consider. With a points in the points of light campaign, it is darkness. Everywhere is darkness. But the cities, the civilizations, those little spots are little points of light. But everything in between is super dangerous. And those can be really fun. Um, there's something to be said for running a campaign in a more civilized way where you don't have to be worry, worried about being waylaid by monsters and bandits on the road. But oftentimes, particularly when you're first starting out, you want to start your players in the frontier. You want to start them in a dangerous terrain. You want to force them to come together as a group through difficulty. Because when you struggle, you come together and you form a team. And that team building process is one of the best things about tabletop RPGs. That team building process, that discovering and making like a found family is such a intricate and intimate part of the game. And that's one of the things that I love the most about it. So in this Points of Light campaign, the nearest big city where our main antagonist is shipping her goods to be able to sell is called Kragen Key, which has a large dwarf and gnomish presence due to the nature of the surrounding terrain. There's a lot of mountains. The starting village is in the foothills. We have a coastal area. We have some thick woods. We have grasslands. We have several different options and venues for the players to explore right out of this starting village and kind of decide where they're going to go from there. Uh, so the next big thing that we really need to map out before we come back and fill everything in, it's good to map out the global political landscape. 
So what that means is that we are going to look at nations and kingdoms. So let's map out the big boys, the big presences in the world, the things that will have impact even in small villages. So we need a nation or a kingdom uh, that oversees the starting village where the players are going to be spending a lot of time initially, and then we need neighboring kingdoms. Are they friendly? Are they constantly at each other's throats? Is there a tension between them? Are they separated by race or religion? Or is it simply geographical? Is it ideological? Is it any of the above? We need to map that out so that the players can get kind of a sense of the world and they can pick up little pieces of that as they walk around. And it doesn't have to be drilled down stuff. You don't need the familial history of the ruling family going back 10,000 years. We just need kind of how they run their government, who the leading figure is, and the name of the capital city. So that's what we're going to do now. First thing is we need to figure out how many nations we want to have. Oftentimes, the the rule that I have used building before is I like to have at least three, um, three really big presences in the world, three big nations that kind of are constantly not necessarily antagonistic against each other, but are constantly just very gently grating at the edges like tectonic plates, just slowly rubbing against each other. And every now and then there's an earthquake. Um, so having those three, those three points gives you, it's not an us versus them kind of thing. With three, it can be more intricate, more balanced, more nuanced. And if you expand beyond that, um, which you certainly, certainly can, um, you get more and more intrigue and you get alliances and you get all kinds of really fun stuff that can come from that. So I want to do at least three. We'll establish the kingdom or country that the players are going to start in and we'll have the two big neighboring ones as well and then we'll come up with names of a couple others that might be some distance away that maybe sometime down the line they're on another continent the players may come across them or it's the foundations for running a second campaign so let's start out with nations and kingdoms Let's start with the first thing that we're going to start with is going to be the starting kingdom. What should we name uh, this? Oftentimes, so one of the little tricks that I use is I think about the kingdom and what it would be based on. So typically someone comes into power in a civilization, in a country, in a kingdom, a, a family comes to power or a particular person or entity comes to power based on their acquisition of something or their belief in something or their just sheer willpower. Um, but oftentimes the, the country is founded on on that one thing. It can be as weird and out there as freedom, or it can be, we found a lot of gold, <laughs> or you know what, here's the only place in the world that you can get really pure iron, and we've built up this nation based purely on iron trade, or copper, or gold, or platinum, or gemstones, or wheat, you could have the only fertile farmland in the near area. So that gives you huge, huge influence over neighboring nations who they have to trade with you for food goods to support their population. There are a lot of different ways to, to kind of tweak it. So what I like to do is I like to pick that one thing and then build that nation up based off of how I think or abstractly think that they would have developed based solely on that. So we know that the area around the starting village has 
a lot of representation geographically. We have foothills, we have mountains, we have a coastline. We know there's a fishing village near our starting village that's not very populated, um, but fish is definitely a thing, although that it's very difficult to build a, a nation off of that unless you're an island nation. Um, we could lean into the mountain part. We have... Uh, we have a strong representation already of dwarves and gnomes in the nation. Um, you know, okay, so we have a couple different areas. We have the coastline, we have the mountains, we have grasslands and deep seated wooded forests. What if, and this plays into intrigue, what if this main nation that the players are starting in is actually run by a council? Uh, and on this council, there are representatives of several of the different races. Uh, so there is an elven representative. There is a dwarven representative. There is a gnomish representative. There is a human representative. Um, we can have, let's make it five. So we have elven representatives who would be from the deep woods. We have the gnomes and the dwarves representing different aspects of the mountains. Uh, then we have the humans who would be really the coastal and uh, the open grassland areas. And then what if we put in a more monstrous race to kind of give, give the whole nation a little bit more of an edge? So what if we have an orcish representative? Uh, we could mix in a lot of orc society into this so we have the five representative of the races and those are balanced let's see so let's have it run by a council so we have the five representative of the races but they are not the sole representatives each shall we say if there's a city over a certain population each one of those cities can send a representative that is elected by that city to serve on the council. And there can never be more than six cities uh, represented on the board. So that would give 11 total members uh, to the council, which is an odd number. And that works for council stuff because then you don't have ties. Uh, so <clears throat> starting kingdom name we will need. So let's just put a uh, name in there temporarily. Uh, and then governed by a council of 11. And that is defined by uh, the five member races of the nation plus six elected representatives from the largest cities. Uh, and the five member races are elves, dwarves, gnomes, humans, and orcs. That's gonna make for some very interesting things um, because that, that can give a lot of flavor. We could have several of the outskirt towns deep in the woods you can have elven holds we can have orcish strongholds and the orcs are always like that tentative presence you know you never really know how they're going to behave so perhaps they've had a very good line of leaders but there's always that under under like under the flesh just a bubbling of just orcish fury that's that's constantly threatening to burst out so that's always a little bit of tension uh that exists on the council and that it takes a really strong firm leader to uh keep them reined in this could be interesting uh because that leads to a lot of intrigue the interplay between the races the relationship between all the different races and the balance of maybe manipulating and controlling those elected seats from each of the cities that could possibly be a 
end game goal for our initial antagonist for uh, Annabelle Rose, if she's maybe gunning for the uh, the Kragen seat on the council, that could be something. Putting herself into a position of power, gaining wealth as a merchant, gaining renown, and then putting herself on the council. Um, so the next thing we should probably do is name this kingdom. Uh, I will give a quick shout out uh, to fantasynamegenerators.com. If you need to generate a whole bunch of names, particularly for cities or villages, or if you need to name NPCs, or if you need to name anything, uh, that is a great, great website to generate a bunch and just look through them. You don't even necessarily have to use any of the ones that come up, but it gives you a good starting point. And maybe you take a couple different ones and put them together and get something that, that kind of fits with what you want. Um, so I'm thinking we need something that has, because this is such a mix I'm thinking the name of this kingdom has to be something that has a little, uh, like gravel to it. We, we kind of did that with the first city, but it needs to have a little meat, a little grit because it's not necessarily, this is not a, a nation built on nobility. This is, this is a nation built kind of by the people, um, Perhaps it took this council coming together to unite all these different cities. So perhaps these different cities still see themselves as city-states, not necessarily part of the whole. So that's another point of like intrigue and tension um, that could definitely come up. So that we can use as a starting point. So... Um, Let's see, how about something with a KH? Codset? No. Uh, con. Conver? Conver, what would the primary, so if we think about what the primary good for this is going to be, is they probably are fairly rich in resources. Each of the different uh, primary cities kind of focuses on a different thing. We have mountainous cities and forest cities for lumber. We have coastal cities. We have a lot of different products that come together and they export them to other nationalities. So it it should be kind of a, a a mixed name, something that sounds both rough, but also prideful. Uh, <clears throat> how about Connorvale? That's more, that's more a city name than an actual nation, uh, for a nation. Okay. Uh, let's go to fantasy name generators and see if we can't find uh, a good name. So let's do that. Uh, oh, there we go. A good one right off the bat. How about Kryunor? Kryunor. The kingdom of Kryunor. It wouldn't actually be a kingdom. It would be a nation. Um, so the starting nation is Kryun... Let's make it Kryundor. Kryundor. It's got a good... Kind of has a certain gravitas to it. Uh, so the nation of Kryundor is governed by a council of 11 members... Five are defined by the member races of the nation, and six are the elected representatives from the six different city-states, essentially, that exist within the nation itself. Um, so we have... Let's do... <clears throat> uh, constant tension between the six city-states 
uh, within. Additional tensions between races. Uh, and we'll say particularly the orcs. Okay. Uh, so we will hash that out a little more. But the next thing we're going to do is let's do two neighboring nations. Uh, so then neighbor one is going to be, uh, let's do a refresh on this and see if we can't find something. This one, I think, so we talked a little bit earlier on how there are coastal islands off the coast and they're mostly untamed. Um, perhaps those coastal islands and that sea serves as a natural barrier between two different uh, nations. So those, those coastal islands are kind of a neutral, untamed territory that serves as a both mystical and dangerous buffer between uh, two fairly powerful nations. Um, <clears throat> let's make this one a little more classic and a little more sinister. So the players start out in something that has a council and intrigue and there's a lot of politic that goes on and manipulations behind the scenes but one of their neighbors across the sea on the other side of the mystical islands is a dangerous and kind of not necessarily overtly evil but a more sinister feeling place um this would be more of a kingdom perhaps steeped in religious fervor uh so let's do something along that lines um what if it's um uh, okay so what if we make it almost elemental uh so if it's a <clears throat> a a society based on religious fervor with a king or a queen that rules with an iron fist and has perhaps they are the also serve as the figurehead of the primary church of the nation so let's do something that is elemental um let's do that that i think that kind of thing you could do like a, a fire name like infernus or uh something that has like that's more infernus is great but it's a little too overt <laughs> you know don't mess with the nation of infernus that's yeah that's a little too heavy-handed um if we did something more like um uh, Maybe water or air. Uh, something that sounds light and doesn't necessarily sound overtly dangerous. Uh, light and airy. Uh, Halatia. <clears throat> yeah, I like the sound of that. Uh, the Kingdom of Halatia. So, that is going to be governed by a king or queen who is also the uh, highest priest in their religion. Uh, steeped in traditions and religious fervor. So we need to name our king or queen, determine if we're going to have a king or queen and name them. Uh, I think we should go queen uh, and then also have something kind of light and not necessarily threatening uh, for her name. Like uh, let's do queen Moira. The sixth. 
just calling her Queen Moira the Sixth implies a long-standing tradition. It implies depth and a a length of rule for this family or this particular structure. Um, so it's just a very simple trick to instantly give, like, you don't have to say, this kingdom has stood for 10,000 years. You say, currently they're ruled by Queen Moira the Sixth, and instantly in your mind you start thinking, well, there was clearly already five Moiras before that, so then there must, it, it's been around for a while. It's a little, like a subconscious nod that gives you a little bit of depth without having to go into explicit detail. Um, which is kind of par for the course for this type of uh, quick building. Uh, so there's that. Uh, the Kingdom of Halatia, governed by Queen Moira the Sixth. Um, they're steeped in religious fervor and traditions. That, I think, is where we'll leave that one for now. Uh, and then we'll move on to neighbor two. <clears throat> there doesn't need to be a lot of details for these. Basically, I don't need a lot more than just the name of the kingdom, kind of what they're about, and who rules them. Unless the players start becoming interested in that, unless the players get tied into some sort of intrigue with that, we may go back and lay out like, uh, for instance, if they have, if it's a, if it's a society steeped in religious fervor, perhaps they have fearsome inquisitors that, you know, are also function as spies that could become entangled in some of the stuff that they're doing in their starting area. So that's something that we can circle back on and kind of fill in later on. But for now, that's good. That's all we really need. So let's do the same thing with another neighbor. I think this other neighbor should be uh, kind of more... Let's see. So we have religious fervor. We have a council. We need something... I don't want to go particularly classic and be like, you know, this is run by a king and there's nobles who overlook the land. There, There's a place for that. But I... I have the feeling, and it just feels like this kind of world doesn't have a place for that right now. But what if someone wanted it to be? So what if this nation is not really tied together? It's their closest land nation, perhaps on the other side of the mountain range, uh, across very dangerous terrain. Again, a geographical buffer to... Uh, define that separation and give a natural break um, and a reason why one nation hasn't overtaken the other. Uh, so on the other side of the mountains, there is, let's say that there is a, how about a puppet king who is, who fancies himself an emperor and wants nothing more than to rule all the lands. There's constantly a little bit of friction and border skirmishes, trying to put silly tariffs on goods coming from our main nation, uh, but he sees himself as this destined, this deity-appointed emperor who shall one day grip the entire world, but really, he's not that good at it, and everybody kind of just sees him as a puppet and really the nation is actually run by the small pieces of nobility that exist around him and pay his dues but they see him as nothing more than a puppet i think that sounds fun uh so this is going to be a kingdom uh governed by a fool of a king who fancies himself An emperor in the making. No one else sees him that way. Um, so, um, <clears throat> nobility uh, rules beneath him and mostly pays him lip service. 
so then we need to name that king. That, I think, uh, we will need something pompous. Absolutely pompous. Completely and totally pompous. Uh... Should we do something like, should we call him like Sir something or give him just a very, very over the top, super dramatic, like ridiculous classic name, uh, like, uh, Thurgood. <laughs> Thurgood the Magnificent, self-named, uh, serves as king. Self-named Thurgood the Magnificent. Uh, everyone kind of treats him as a cast-off, like, kid's magician. You know, that sounds like a really, really cheap magician that you hire for, like, a kid's birthday party. Thurgood the Magnificent. No one takes him seriously. Perfect. Uh, so that's going to be the other neighbor. So we have the two neighbors are the kingdom of Halatia. We need to name the uh, the other kingdom run by Thurgood. Uh, I think it should have a name that is not particularly good. Um... And by that I mean, so we have Thurgood the Magnificent, who wants to be this emperor, who wants to rule over this world. He should have a country name that just sounds like mud, basically, because it's funny. Uh, so, what, what should we name it? Um, that's really, really interesting, because there... Um, what if we need something like simple? Uh, like underbrush or something? It's just something that gets trodden on. Sod. The kingdom of sod. Uh, what about like under. Uh, the kingdom of underwood? It sounds like it could be a thing, but really no one's really going to take that seriously. Uh, it sounds almost like swampy and not particularly classy. And really that, that kind of embodies it. We'll say that it's, uh, we'll throw in here that it is mostly swampland. This is a, a puppet king Thurgood the Magnificent, the ruler of Underwood, which is pretty much just swamps, um, kind of uh, likening to the uh, the king who keeps building castles on swampland and they keep sinking, so they just put a new one on top of it and a new one on top of it and a new one on top of it, that kind of thing. Uh, so that is nations and kingdoms surrounding. So our starting nation is uh, Creondor. The nation that's governed by a council of 11, defined by the five member races, plus the six elected representatives from the largest cities. Uh, so the, the five race racial representatives are elves, dwarves, gnomes, humans, and orcs. There's constant tension between the six city-states within who all see themselves as kind of the strongest and uh, the best member of that council and they're constantly vying and bickering with one another uh and then add in the ta the natural like racial tensions between everybody and the bubbling underbelly of orcish pride and rage that always seems like it's about to break out and we have a pretty good cauldron to kind of throw the players into which is a ton of fun so let's circle back real quick to our starting village and we need to name our starting village uh, I think it should be a pretty simple name. This is 
a two in town. I covered in the first video, I like to define the size of villages and towns by how many inns they have. A very small farmer's village just has one inn where everybody goes after work, after a long day, to drink themselves into oblivion. And then as you get a little bigger, you get a high class inn. So you have the regular inn that everybody's used to, but then you also have a really high class one, typically based around a brothel, but you have a higher class inn as well. And then as the town expands, you you pop up more inns. You have one that's particularly for merchants where a lot of deals get done. And then you have one for travelers who are coming through, another one for farmers. And um, they kind of propagate and expand with the town. So that's a very quick and easy way to define the size of a town if you're, if you're looking for that. Um, so I think this starting village should have a pretty simple name. This is not a a fancy well-to-do village they do okay it's a two-in town they've kind of established themselves they have some merchant class um so you know it shouldn't be a name like mud but something a little bit better um so there's a fishing village just across the grasslands just down the foothills where a lot of folks from the village go down to work and to fish and to ship and we established that they don't live down there because of the tides and a lot of flooding. So they've moved up into the foothills, but they still have their their base and their harbor down uh, on the shore. So what if we called it something as simple as uh, Seacoast or, uh, yeah, Sea Seacoast or... Something as simple as, like, Seaview. The small village of Seaview. Very simple. Um, that kind of fits with the the simple folk of small towns in a middle age setting are not particularly creative. Um, so, a town up on the foothills that overlooks their former village that always flooded out would be called Seaview. So, I think that fits pretty well. So, that's what we have. We have... A, we've named our starting village. We have the Points of Light campaign. We've named the next biggest city, Crag and Key, which is uh, where most of the goods from Seaview are shipped to and uh, sent onward. Uh, and that exists in the nation of Kriundor, which is governed by a council of 11, with the five member races, constant tension between the six city states, each one electing representative to the council. We have the neighboring kingdom of Halatia, which is across the sea, across the uh, offshore islands uh, that are not really established by anyone. They're a natural buffer. And that is ruled by Queen Namora VI. And it's a nation steeped in religious traditions and fervor. And then on the other side of the mountains, existing almost entirely in swampland, is the nation, the kingdom of Underwood, governed by emperor in the making in his own mind, Thurgood the Magnificent. Uh, but really, it's run by the nobility who just pay him lip service because they, it takes a lot of stress off of them and they can just do whatever they want. Uh, so that's what we got. We got the three big nations that are nearby. Those are kind of... We don't need to do a ton more with that, we can come back through uh, in the next video. What we're going to do is we're going to go back through what we've established and then we're just going to flush out a little bit and a little bit and a little bit. Uh, so just add little bits like perhaps, as I mentioned, perhaps the kingdom of Halatia has inquisitors that they send out to try and convert people or operate as a secret police and spies. Uh, perhaps the kingdom of Underwood is renowned for something and we'll figure that out. Just little bits and tidbits that the players can pick up on. And then as we uh, as we come back, we need to flesh out and name and establish the six city-states that exist in the nation that the players will be playing in. So we'll establish that, and then we circle back to the starting village, and we lay out some NPCs, we lay out some quest lines, and then we're pretty much ready to go. 
So that's all I got for this video. I hope that you liked it. I hope that this is helpful to you in any way. Please let me know in the comments. And as always, like and subscribe. It helps a ton just for visibility so other folks can get some help too. So that's what I got. I hope that you're enjoying the series. I will see you on the next one. So until then, as always, as ever, remember, be good to each other. Bye, everybody.